Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Easter Sunday. So exciting. We have so much to celebrate today. Um, my name's Melanie, and I'm one of the leaders here. And I just want to say that this is our family service today. So there's no River Valley Kids or Club 57 this morning. Um, we will all be worshiping up here together. Um, the narthex, that lovely word, word that Darren always talks about, is the great big area out back here. And that is an open room that if you have a child or if you need, that needs space to run or whatever, that is for you. We will leave the doors open so that you can still participate in everything. Um, but you can, you can have that time. We also have coloring um, pages at the back door here and fidgets at the sound booth if you need those as well. Um, if you're interested in giving to River Valley Wesleyan Church, you can do so by using the boxes. There's three of them around the room. Um, there's also offering envelopes at the back as well. Or you can e-transfer <laughs> um, at rvwcfinance at gmail.com. So I think that's it for right now. But I just um, I invite you to worship. You know, he is risen. I was going to do that, but I know a lot of people don't know what to do after that. But we used to do, he is risen. And then everybody would say, he, he is risen indeed. So what a wonderful day it is to worship together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. You are alive. This is why we worship you because we serve a risen king and father we just um continue to invite your presence here this morning um and just speak to us and help us to celebrate you on this resurrection sunday in jesus name amen amen well it's easter and uh you know some people think of uh, bunnies and eggs, uh, not chickens, which is weird with the eggs, but uh, I never understood that. But really what it's about is it's about uh, the fact that sin, death, and the grave were defeated on this day when Jesus arose from the dead. And that's huge. And that's really the entire point <laughs> of what we're doing here. Uh, Christmas, awesome. Easter, really, uh, when he came, it's amazing. Uh, but when he died and rose again, that's, that's what we're celebrating. So, and the sun's out, and it just feels fitting, because it's been like raining for 1,700 years. Uh, and so we just invite you all to stand. Uh, we're going to celebrate. We've already been celebrating here, uh, just singing some songs to Jesus. And we just want you guys to just join us, and, and we're going to celebrate him together. And let's go for it. See the tomb where he laid, see the stone rolled away. He is risen, he is risen, he's alive. See his hands, see his feet, touch his scars and believe. He is risen, he is risen, he's alive. Oh. He's alive, he lives, he lives, all honor and power are his, all glory forever, amen, Jesus lives, no Jesus Hear the shackles breaking free. Hear the song of the redeemed. He is moving. He is moving. He's alive. Take this freedom. Take this love. Can you feel it rising up? He is here. He is here. 
He's alive. He lives. All honor and power are His. All glory forever. Amen. Jesus lives. Oh, Jesus lives. You took all our shame, left it in the grave. We're forgiven. We're forgiven. The work forever done, only by the blood. It is finished. It is finished. You took all our shame, left it in the grave. We're forgiven. We're forgiven. The work have to do glorious day for sure you guys so let's sing this one together if anybody uh, feels your toe tapping a little bit that's okay go with it all right let's sing this together I was buried beneath my shame could carry the kind of weight it was my turn till I met you I was breathing but not alive all my failures I tried to hide it was my turn till I, till I met you. He called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my saved my soul freedom is all i know now your freedom is all that i know the old made new jesus when i met you you called my You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day
rescue my sin was heavy the chains break at the weight of your glory i needed shelter i was an orphan now you called me a citizen of heaven when i was broken you were my healing now your love is the air that i'm breathing i have a future my eyes are open because when you call my name This next song we're going to sing is a song that whether you've realized it or not, you've been hearing it before and after every service, I think, for the past year it's been playing, and it's, been called, it's called Ain't No Grave. And the original was written in 1934 by a 12-year-old boy who would eventually become a preacher and a songwriter, but he's 12, and he was sick with tuberculosis, and his family prayed for his health, and in, in response, he spontaneously performed this song. And a number of years later, Bethel Music added some more verses to it. Um, I want to read John 11:25 when Jesus was talking to Martha. Before he raised Lazarus from the dead, he told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. And in Revelation 1:18, in the vision God gave John about the end of days, the Son of Man, Jesus said, I am the living one. I died, but look. I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. And this song is a testimony of who Jesus is and what he has done and a celebration of faith in the risen Savior. So let's sing it and celebrate it together today. And it's a little twangy, too, so. Oh, shame is a prison as cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber. He's come to take my name Oh, love is my redeemer Lifting me up from the ground Love is a power Where my freedom song is found There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down There ain't no When I hear that 
trumpet sound I'm gonna rise up out of the ground There ain't no It reminds me of those, I've got a mansion over the hilltops, I'll fly away, hanky waving songs. So that's what it reminds me. Let's sing that Jesus reigns above it all. The reign of darkness now has ended in the kingdom of in the kingdom of light forever under your dominion you're the king of my life you're the king of my life you reign above it all you reign above it all over the universe and over every heart there is no heart You reign above it all. Oh, on the cross, the work was finished. God, you 
celebrating um, lay it at his feet let's just sing this together oh come to the altar and if you need to do that do it now and I just encourage you to do that this morning Say 
God for this morning. We thank you for this time. God, as we move into the next part of our, uh, of our service, we just um, pray a blessing over uh, the words that are spoken and uh, that we would hear from you, God. I just thank you for this time that we could spend with you, Lord, just with, with music, just worshiping you. Um, it's awesome. And so we're just, we're thankful, God, we're thankful for what you've done for us. You freed us from the grave, from death, and uh, Words can't even fathom it, although we try. And so, Lord, I just thank you for that in Jesus' name. You may be. Amen. Wasn't that a wonderful time of worship? And it's not too late if you have anything that you need to lay at the altar. There will be time. Don't leave here today without surrendering to Jesus because he is alive. Today is snacks for Sunday school, so if you forgot to bring your snacks for Inglewood, you can still get them to Pastor Janelle today or tomorrow. Um, reminder that we are collecting fresh apples and oranges, goldfish crackers and other so snack-sized crackers, and gluten and nut-free granola bars. Um, we will be having an Easter egg hunt immediately following the service. Um, this is for kids and teens that want to participate. So please have the kids um, at the end of the service go out by the big window there. We're going to kind of just gather there in the foyer and just kind of see how many people um, 
are going to be participating because they want to be able to let you know how many eggs you will be able to collect. Um, now, there is also a resurrection egg and somewhere downstairs, and this is an empty egg with a note inside. So if you find this egg, you will win a prize. After the Easter egg hunt, please return all the plastic eggs in the bin that we will have downstairs so that you, we can reuse them next year. We are planning baptisms um, in the near future, so if you are interested in taking this next step of your faith or learning more about baptism, take your connection card. I guess I do have one. <laughs> They're in the back of your chairs. And um, mark it and then drop it in one of the offering boxes, and one of the pastors will get, back, will get in contact with you. And next Sunday morning, we will be continuing our series in Dear John, and we will have our kids and teen programs for grades K to 7. So that's all for right now. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, thank you. Welcome. I'll do what she didn't. He is risen. Now you know how. He is risen. He's almost awake. I thought the music would get you there. I honestly did. Oh, I appreciate all of you being here. I just got to stare you down. I don't know what's a thing. Just got to look you all in the eye before uh, stuff happens. Yeah, there's crazies out there. Thanks, Mel, for coming. <laughs> it's true. Well, today is Family Sunday, in case you didn't hear that already. So there are some things. So prepare yourself, little people. I'm going to need your help. So those of you who are under the age of 20, uh, I'm going to ask for a volunteer or two in a little bit. So prepare yourself. If you're feeling that you would want to help me do something here, then great. If not, I'm just going to make you because you're young and you'll get over the trauma at some point through therapy, I'm sure. I'm going to read a, a section of scripture here, and then uh, hopefully we'll talk about it. Lord, add your blessing to your word. Uh, Matthew 27, 45 to 54. This has been uh, on my mind, actually, for some time. I find it fascinating. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock. At about 3 o'clock, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them uh, ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed, reed stick, so that he could drink. But the rest said, wait, let's see whether Elijah comes to save him. Then Jesus shouted out again and released his spirit. And at that moment... The curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs were opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead, and they left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city of Jerusalem and appeared to many people. The Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. This man, they said, this man was truly, truly was a son of God. You know, out of all the epic craziness that we just read, if you really think about what transpired, uh, if you think about all of that, why tear the veil? Why out of all of that stuff, why tear it and why tear it at noon in particular. Why do that? I mean, it would be pretty convincing if the tombs opened up and some pretty holy people came out and then came to visit in your town. Pretty good odds that if, uh, where's that ancient, there's one up here in Nerepis, the one where you're going to be buried, right? For a hundred bucks or something? That one that's, uh... <laughs> anyway, there's a graveyard here in town that if you've lived here for more than, I don't know, however long he's lived here, you get to be buried there for pretty cheap, I guess. So you can imagine that sucker cracking open, all the holy people getting up and coming to visit. <laughs> I mean, like this morning. Like, what time is it? Is it noon yet? Nope. Got to look for the clock. I mean, they start walking in here, smelling all great. 
pretty good odds they did, actually. I mean, restoration is restoration. There's no odor, nothing left other than what is new and good. But I mean, seriously, like you're considering what we just read at the time of his death and like tombs open, people coming back to life. And yet there's this entry about the curtain being torn from top to bottom at noon, no less. That's kind of odd, a little bit, a little bit. In um, this thing that we had read at the moment of the Messiah's death, the moment of the one who was predicted to come, to die, and to be raised again that we celebrate today, God provided a number of miraculous signs. At the moment um, that we read this, it draws attention to these signs. It draws attention to what happened historically, testifying to their reality, being confronted with their reality. In the temple, the Holy of Holies was, was the innermost sanctuary, okay? Let's just take this room and make it the Holy of Holies for now. Okay, let's just pretend. Let's pretend. Cram it all in here. This is the Holy of Holies, the place where only the priest went once a year. Once a year, right? This is the one place he would come once a year. So we'll just enclose it into this area. This is the place where the presence of God was said to abide, to rest the place was so sacred that only on the Day of Atonement, which was that once a year, only one man, the high priest, was allowed to enter, even then with a belt tied around his waist in case he was struck dead, honestly. He offered the blood of a special sacrifice to atone for the sins of Israel. Once a year, specifically. The room outside of the Holy of Holies, let's, oh, narthex, there we go. Love that word, right? Let's just pretend that's out there. That was called the holy place. There's a holy holies and then there's a holy place. Just for the sake of our, I don't know, crummy demonstration, honestly. You should ordain the, ordinate the place so that you can really feel like it. But the two rooms um, were separated by a very thick curtain. And really that curtain or veil, however you want to say it in whatever translation you're going to use, that curtain was very thick and it separated all of humanity out there from the presence of the living God in here. That's what it did. At the moment of Jesus' death, it was torn from top all the way down to the bottom. It was torn to show that it was, it was torn to show that it was at God's initiative. He set the whole thing up in the beginning and he tore it from top to bottom. For us, the tearing opened the way for anyone to enter the presence of God through the, subs the substitution that he brought in himself, the sacrifice of the Messiah allowed for that to happen. And at that moment, rip top to bottom. And during the centuries and centuries there were of Israel's existence, it was unheard of for common people, the common people to consider approaching God. There was an entire tribe dedicated. The Levites were dedicated to that. And then one being the high priest. And it's, it's a picture, right, of Jesus showing up, really. It's a picture of him going in and having this conversation with God and then come back out to the people. It's Moses meeting on the mountain, coming down all glowy and crazy, expressing from God to the people, right? That's how it worked. During those centuries, for the first time, provision had been made for God to accept a sinful human being as forgiven, having been made righteous through his son. Did you know that you've been made righteous? Do you feel like a righteous person? Do you feel like you're winning? <laughs> you came in here, you feel like you're winning? I don't know, is it really a feeling anyway? It is not. It is a fundamental understanding of what he did, and it is solidified for all time, nothing to change that. The veil in the temple, torn from top to bottom. The temple had two curtains, really. One in front of the holy place and the other separating the holy place from the most holy place. And it was the second one that was torn to give that access, demonstrating that God had opened access up to himself. That's when the priest would have had a very, I mean, just put yourself in his shoes, right? I mean, 
yeah, I mean, holy as it is, but just dudes walking in, right? At this very opportune time, I might add, he's walking in to do his thing and he hears <laughs> rip behind him. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man, it's God. To, to, he gets out of the place he resides. It was for us to be able to enter either way, whichever way you look at it, him coming out to us, us coming into him. It made the opportunity available for you to have eternal life. And it doesn't stop there, by the way. As much as there's fire insurance, you know, and the preservation of your very soul for all eternity, it doesn't stop there. But it gives us, with, it gives us full access to God without fear of being struck dead because we are unholy people. It's not that he wanted to decimate what's around him. It's just his presence was so holy and you bring something that isn't, it's just going to nuke that thing. And you happen to be a part of it. He's remedied that thing. He has made you holy and awesome. I just, I don't know. I, I think of it, kids. Like if you're, if you're in, your, in your room and you have a, I don't know, curtain on your window. Uh, maybe we have blinds now. That's kind of a bad example. But hey, let's take the blinds. And you hear, rip top to bottom. Mm, what are you thinking? Parents are thinking, hmm, expensive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it actually reminded me, I was, I was thinking of this, you know, all the theological implications. And all I could think of those is those uh, videos online, the guys trying to load their quads into a truck and they drive it right back through the window or they hit up on the roof or they flip the thing on themselves. Like, that's the way I think of this, like, guy's coming in to do his thing in the Holy of Holies, and then rip, like, ooh, that's going to cost a lot. The incidentals. I didn't do it, man. I didn't do it. You know, that kind of thing. But that's the reality. No one did it except the Sovereign Almighty, and he ripped that sucker down the middle for us. It's that uh-oh moment. I just want to read a couple of scriptures before I do something crazy. This is Hebrews 6.19. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Hebrews 10, 19 and 21 also says this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, right? Brothers, sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because the blood of Jesus, by his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into that most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house. So, I need my hippie to go have a seat. Leanne has graciously accepted the challenge. So she's going to sit, sit behind my nasty looking screen over there. I couldn't find anything tall enough. And my wife said, that looks horrible. I know it does. But now, <laughs> now you're going to remember this forever. Anyway, Leanne's just going to be the She's going to be the guinea pig of answering my questions. So I need a bold kid under the age of 20-ish. Oh, yeah, I'll do it, man. Come on down. Let's do this. So you go over there, and behind this big thingy, there are colorful items. Don't take the plush one, but get me one of those dispensers, okay? Just grab one of them. That's fine. Keep going. Yep, give her. Anybody else want to help me? Because I'm going to need more of these things. Let's see. Oh, yeah, sure. Let's do it, man. Come on down. So you go get one too. So bring it over here. Just grab one of them, the plastic one. Leave the plush one for later because he's entertaining. But give me a plastic one. So let's pretend this is the Holy of Holies and we're all trapped in here, you know. We're doing our thing. And all the humans are represented by Leanne. So pre, pre-crucifixion, pre-resurrection. Yeah, let me give me that one. That's cool. So Leanne, I uh, collect M&M dispensers, in case you didn't know. And my office is full of them. So I have in my hand, uh, you're not allowed to peek, by the way. Not allowed to look in the re reflection in the window. Not allowed to do anything like that. What color M&M dispenser do I have on the podium right now? Ah, see? No access. Can't see a thing. Knows nothing. <laughs> Let's do it. OK. So I have another relatively beautiful M&M dispenser that's been in my family for almost a generation. What color is he? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh. Wrong again. Why? <laughs> Why? Because you can't see. There is no access. There is nothing. Okay, grab the plush one, because he's my favorite, if you would. 
So people give me things, I want to point out, like some of them I collect, and then random people give me stuff. So <laughs> yeah, I wonder if she's uh, gone into my office now that I've said plush. So I have two of my plush favorites. You can have a seat now if you want. Not Leanne, just the kids. You can go sit down. I have two of them on my podium. OK, Leanne? Can you tell me what the color both of them are? Yes, this is awesome. <laughs> thank you, Leanne. You can, you can stand up and go back to your seat now. Just to show, thank you. Yeah. Just to show. <laughs> I don't know, it's Family Sunday. You gotta do something, right? I mean, you can't see the colors. We were so separated by this veil, by this curtain. There was no access. There had to be. I almost was going to send you over to whisper in your ear because that's the only way that we would be able to communicate with God if somebody were to come over, get the information, and take it back to Leanne. That's how it was. Whether you realize the, uh, the realities of that or not for the people living way back in the day, before this veil was torn, that was it. Once a year, you would come in and give that sacrifice once a year. And now we have free access. So I was gonna knock it down, but that'd be too weird. Go over and kick the thing over and possibly injure you. But thank you, Leanne, for doing that. So you can see that you can know. I mean, this example and my volunteer, I mean, this, this thing is crude, really, and is limited in the way that we could convey the spiritual truths that are given to us. But there was a barrier. Take that and leave it as it would. There was a barrier. There was something in the way. It limits the explanation in many ways, but our access to his holiness, his righteousness, his forgiveness was limited and slightly blocked. There was no free and easy way in. And honestly, if I dare say, now that we've gotten, what, 2,000 plus years, I guess, 2,000 years-ish of access, we're just so accustomed to it as normal. I'm so accustomed to my phone, I just become, uh, I, can, I can just depend on it. It becomes easy and simple. It, it becomes something that isn't cherished anymore. Or maybe the reality of the hardship to get to here is lost, perhaps. Access to his holiness, his righteousness, and his forgiveness. Matthew 27, 62 to 66 course you did. Why do I even have to wonder, Seth? You are awesome. The next day on the Sabbath, the leading priests and the Pharisees went to see Pilate. They told him, sir, we remember that that deceiver once said he, while he was still alive, after three days, I will rise from the dead. Now they're nervous. I mean, when dead people get up out of the grave and a massive curtain gets torn top to bottom, with nobody touching it, the odds are you start to take note, take stock. What did this guy really say? Now they're scared. This might actually happen. Anyway, I got to keep reading. After three days, I will rise from the dead. So we request, this is them going and asking, we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body. That's the official story. And then telling everyone he was raised from the dead. If that happens, we'll be worse off than we were at first. Pilate replied, take guards, secure it as best you can. So they sealed the tomb, posted guards to protect it. The most powerful government at the time sealed his tomb and posted guard to prevent anything from happening. I find it fascinating, like even, even if, even if they didn't do that, somebody came and stole his body. I mean, it would just be hearsay. Even if that were to happen, it would just be a, a chatter for a few generations. It'd be done. They wanted to keep someone from stealing his body. And as much as our faith is attached to the miraculous, it's very much supported by history. If you just think it through, just go and read. Things did occur. The Roman government at the time put him in a tomb and held him there. Government and people tried to make sure that he wasn't a legitimate Messiah, and I'm grateful they did. Because all they did was reinforce that he is. 
the legitimate Messiah. In the end, the proofs are in recorded history. I had an interesting uh, video kind of pop up. This guy was talking about the difference between faith and knowing. And I, I ask you the question, like, there's, there's knowing, like, it's, there's knowing something, like, if I fall down, it might hurt. And then there's reasonable proofs up to a point where you take a leap of faith, where you just have to jump off and believe. Everything seems reasonable for this Messiah to be born. I mean, if you take everything from the 600 years beforehand or plus about his predictions, birth, life, death, resurrection, from multiple different people over hundreds of years, then just the logistical nightmare of keeping a Messiah in the ground for three days, it should have been too hard, but he's not there. What do you do with those things? And then you advance further in the story where you have people who are testifying, saying, I've seen him. He has appeared to us, not just one or two. It's not just hearsay. Somebody stole his body and hid it and started spreading rumor. Do you know I talked to that guy? He came to visit. Fascinating. Matthew 28, 1 to 7 says this. Did I give that to you? I don't know if I did. Oh, sweet. See? You're reading my mind, man. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, <laughs> that's awful, eh? Like the other Mary. Anyway, they went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. That's funny, anyway. I'll leave it alone, I'll leave it alone. His face shone like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow, and the guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Can you imagine explaining that to your boss? Oh, guess what? Uh, sorry, fella. The angel spoke to the woman. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you were looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Just as he said would happen. Come and see where his body was lying. And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I've told you. Oh, there's so much in there that we could be here for hours. I know you don't want to be. But there's a lot in there. Man, just roll it aside, sat on it. Listen, our fella is gone. He got up. He burned down every superstition at the time that he could by rising three days later. Like three days, you're dead, dead. And then, you know, over there, they had no refrigeration, right? So you're, you're buried pretty fast. And you decompose even faster. He got up and walked out. Why tear the veil? That's really the, the question I've been pondering. I mean, there's all kinds of things in there, but why tear this veil at all? I mean, of all the things, all the testimonies to be said, why tear the veil? It's so that you can have the good news. You can have it yourself. I would say that the good news is more than just eternal life. I mean, he offers that. Honestly, you want to confess your sin, the thing that separates you from him, we would be very excited about that, and I would love to throw you in some water and baptize you, for the record. And if you're going to make that step, we're going to talk about that in a minute, and just pray a little bit. But taking that step is reasonable to me. He is legitimate that you can have good news, but that eternal life is just, that's just a small thing. It's a big thing, but it's so small in regards to everything that he brings to us. I would say that the good news is more than that because it's deeply personal and it meets you where you live. It meets you in, in your circumstance. And the scriptures from beginning to end, like we don't ax off the, the Old Testament and just say it's reference material. It's the picture from beginning right through to Revelation of this good news. If you take... Um, the boys in Egypt, when they were in captivity in Egypt, the picture of bondage, the picture of reasonable, uh, unreasonable slavery of a people group and being freed. That's the good news. It's in contrast of death to life. We talk about eternal life and leave it in, a, in an open massive thing that you can grab a hold of. But in reality, he talks about being in bondage to something and then being free, being brought from death to life. He talks about shame 
and innocence and that you can be restored to innocence. You do not have to live in shame. You can be restored to innocence. I think of King David, a man after God's own heart, even after he did some pretty ugly, dumb things, killing people, sleeping with women, breaking up marriage, shame, being brought back to innocence darkness and ignorance, and he brings light. He'll bring wisdom. Read any of Solomon's stuff. Not our Solomon's, but the Bible Solomon's. Read that stuff. I mean, the wisdom literature and just the insight into actual life instead of just this fictitious thoughts about what we want or don't want. What the scripture teaches us about what is right and good and what actually be beneficial and not just so that you can survive life, but that can build you up and give you purpose. From death to life, you can have go from darkness and ignorance to light and wisdom. Solomon shares so much wise counsel. You know, you can go from isolation and hostility. Usually hostility leads to isolation. You can go from there to union, to solidarity with others. The church is, is a unified bunch. We don't seem like it most of the time. I know. We're trying. But if you can overcome our shortcomings and look at what he offers us, you can move from isolation, from hostility, into union and solidarity with people, with his kingdom. Anger and hostility leading us to isolate away. I mean, that's, that's the mantra of society at the moment, it seems. I don't like, I don't want, I hate X. They put it on video and share. It's the way our society is. You know, you can go from toil, like work and just depressive state of doings and doings and doings. You can go from that to peace. And you can still be in the same circumstance even. And you have peace. He can even move you beyond that. Try all you want. You will never, ever be satisfied. Work, I don't know. Well, let's talk again in a year if you want to keep going down this road of toil and work and just, I can do this myself. You will never be satisfied. And Jesus offers you peace even when it's tough. Honestly, he offers peace when the bottom falls out of your life. Certainly. I mean, that's usually when we look for it, right? When things are really ugly and nasty and foolishly crazy. But what if you're just concerned? That's reasonable. He's there, even just in basic concerns. Life doesn't have to be ending for you to find him. He doesn't offer just peace when you're about to feel like you're going to die or when your life as you know it is going to end. When you're just concerned about the next few minutes, it doesn't take catastrophe to call on the name of Jesus. It doesn't take catastrophe for you to trust his name. If there was ever a, a time or a, a time and a place, uh, the resurrection testifies that you can trust his word. He said crazy things about himself. I am the son of God. I am the Messiah. I will show up in three days after they kill me. Is that not enough to say I would trust him over Ottawa? I would trust him over my own mother's word. Maybe that's closer. My most trusted friends. I would trust him over my own thoughts about life. Is that not reasonable? How much more concrete does it take? Get up out of the ground. All kinds of people die and they're in their tombs. They can even be visited. But the documented, government-controlled access tomb of Jesus is empty. The darkness was for three hours. His death lasted three days. And after he proved without a doubt who he was and what he came to do, it was all done. Nothing will ever change what he has done. You can view it differently. You can live your life independently of him. I get that. I do. I did that. And if I could convey anything, it's don't do that. <laughs> it's, it's expensive. 
Nothing will ever change what he has done. And this free gift of new life, this sustaining power for your life will never, ever change. It just doesn't. You do. Your attitudes and the things that you take in from friends, family, and the environment that you live in. I get it. I do. It swallows in. It, it bites and takes chunks out of your life. And if you're not going to be committed in a, in a sensible way, I don't know, sensible in an abnormal, crazy way, because society is different. They think differently about this. But if you're committed to him in a majorly intense way that I'm expressing to you this morning, that you would give up your toil for peace, that you would give up your anger and hostility, your isolation for what he is offering, you will never be let down. His spirit will never leave you, even on your deathbed. There is hope now currently for your life right now if you're willing to step into it life can be different and fuller because of him today we are going to sing songs or a song i'm going to give you that opportunity but while the people are doing their shuffling and moving uh, I want to say you know easter's cool because you get trapped in a coming like your your family makes you come and you're kind of stuck here but I want to give you this opportunity. I mean, it, it doesn't mean that, um, I don't believe you know Jesus, but I knew a guy for a couple of years. I thought he was a Christian and he wasn't. It was really funny. It's not funny because he could have died, but it's, it's funny to me that people can go through and, and be a part of a group like this for several years and just not step over that line. You can believe that Jesus is real, that he existed, died, raised, but it's about the confession of your heart, the things that you have inside. And the first part of this thing is if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, like that, that Redeemer who would redeem your life, I would invite you to do that today. Take that leap of faith, and all you have to do is confess, Lord, I have done wrong. Lord, I have done wrong, and I accept your forgiveness, and I believe, because you rose from the dead, that I am now a new creation. Amen. It's just that simple. It's that simple. Baptized or not. <laughs> so now I turn my attention to the rest of you in the room. You know, I outlined some things because the gospel is more than just um, a statistical good news statement. It is as, as I have described, from death to life. And when you look through the scriptures from beginning to end, any any story, any uh, passage of time will show bondage to freedom. It will show shame being shed for innocence. And I think that's the hardest one in the list of things that I've shared, that God could actually restore, that Jesus could restore your innocence. His goal is to restore humanity to garden, right? Before sin ruined you, we still deal with the effects our world is busted up pretty bad, but you can be restored to innocence. Darkness to ignorance, they can be taken and moved to light in wisdom. Isolation, hostility, I feel like that's part of one too. Hostility towards maybe, you know, not me, but the personification of me, like, is it building, is it is it people that's causing you to isolate from, from him? And I, I don't even mean that you have to join this church per se, but isolating from him. Are you working hard and it's suffering for it? And I don't mean just at work. I mean in life. You're toiling and you're not really getting anywhere. He can bring peace and that's the good news. Because it's, it meets your life wherever you are. The good news that he brings and he's solidified and is anchored in his resurrection that we're celebrating today. This is what he's offering. This is what you can have, even, even as a little person. You can have a new life in him. I want to pray for you and we're going to sing. And the opportunity is here for you to confess uh, as you sit, honestly, there's, if you're a traditionalist, there's some altars even here that have padded stuff for your knees if you want it. 
people will come and pray with you. I mean, all of it. We'll do all the cool things. But let me say that this is significant for your future. Lord, I pray for help. I pray for you to meet us in a real way. We were praying this morning for your spirit to be here. And Why would I have any expectation it isn't? I don't. Father, this morning for the needs of the people who sit here, the needs of the people who are trying and feeling like failures. Lord, I pray you would restore them to what you created them to be. Lord, that you would exchange bondage for freedom, that you would exchange this isolation for solidarity and union with you, that there could be meaningful relationship. Lord, that you would take our shame and restore our innocence. Lord, make us wise. Teach us your truths. Lord, let us confess and be renewed that your kingdom would grow. This is not an easy burden that you bore on that day. And Lord, let us be sober by your resurrection as much as your crucifixion. Lord, bring about good things for us. Teach us your ways and that we would rely on you and not our own thoughts. Lord, in your powerful name, amen. You can stand or you can sit however you want to respond to God speaking to you today. Let's sing.
decision today. Tell somebody. Share it with us. We want to know because we want to celebrate with you. And he can be trusted with what we give him. It doesn't matter whatever we're going through. He can be trusted. And I think that's the truth that we need to remember is that God can be trusted with our yes even when we don't know what, we're, what the answer is going to be. So I just invite you to say yes to him today. He is risen. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, we just thank you for your truth and your promise, Father, that you reign above it all and that we can trust you with our whole life. And no matter what's going on, no matter the good, the bad, you are there and you reign above it all and you are victorious. Father, be, be with us this week. Speak to us. Show us what it is that you have for us, Lord. We want to know more of you. And Father, as we leave here today, Lord, help us to leave with the joy and the victory that you are alive and that you came out of that grave. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And so I'll remind you, um, the kids and teens that would like to participate, to meet 